Every cell of our body contains complete genetic information. That means that in every cell, our outlook, thinking, behavior, and individuality is defined on long protein chains. This fantastic order in a fragile equilibrium state decides between health and sickness. Because of the constant regeneration of cells, there is a chance that genetic information can be altered. The first three months of pregnancy is the most critical phase because cells are dividing rapidly and the smallest failures can have fatal outcome. In our film, we report a very rare genetic disorder, the CAT6 syndrome, which is located on chromosome number eight. We visit affected children and adults to show how different this disease can be established and how different the symptoms can be. The most common epiphenomenons are intellectual deficits, delayed language development, delayed head growth, heart anomalies, or complications from the intestinal tract. The disease is so rare that even most medical professionals do not know about it. With the help of an international organization, the CAT6 Foundation, we travel through many countries to visit affected people with their families and we discuss the different features of this disease with scientists. Our hope is to increase attention and contribute more awareness. This should help to increase the quality of life of the affected people and their families. We also focus on the problems associated with CAT6 to help to avoid complications with early recognition. We start our journey in Austria, where we visit Laura and Leo, who are taken care of in a special facility for young people with and without disabilities. Leo and Paulina have come to our school two years ago after their time in kindergarten. Both visit our so-called sun class. Paulina is a child who is very sociable and loves to interact with everybody in our class. She always knows which child is absent, knows exactly where all the things belong, and what we do with the kids. In Innsbruck, we meet Monica Ramal, the founder of the CAT6 Foundation Austria. I initiated the CAT6 Foundation Austria in 2019 because my niece Ella is affected. The primary purpose was to increase the attention to this disease. She was worldwide number 116 with this disease, and at that time it was thought that she was the singular one in Europe. After press work, we were able to attract interest, and one day the press officer of the Tyrol Clinics gave me a call and told me that they care for two more children in their institution. The foundation was established to help children like Ella to bring awareness to society and to give them a feeling of what it means to live with a child with a special and rare disease like CAT6 and to facilitate research with the chance of healing. For me, it's normal, because she needs a lot of attention and you cannot leave her alone because of the risk of injury or she runs away. And so for me, this is okay. My parents often split. One part is doing something with Paulina, the other part is something with me, like skiing, swimming, or something else. Due to that, this is not a bad situation for me and I fully understand it. We had some critical situations, especially when she was very young, and we did not know that her intestinal tract was not completely developed during pregnancy. It was twisted and nothing went through. It was a dramatic situation, because surgery had to be performed very quickly, and as she was very young, we were afraid she would not survive. 
Our visit to Gianna in Farmington Hills in Michigan showed a completely different characteristic of the same disease. Gianna can speak, ride a bicycle, and walk alone without help. Gianna was first diagnosed in 2016 through an intellectual disability panel. Um, your turn. No, it's your turn. Yeah, it's um, oriental. Oriental. Gianna's every day is, uh, she functions really well when there's routine, when she knows exactly what she needs to do. She wakes up at the same time, knows what school is, knows what time that she has to get her lunch. When we have to break routine sometimes, that's when we get a little bit of a struggle. Um, she likes to know exactly what's going to happen and, you know, uh, the times that it's going to happen. It's on saxophone. Her mother and a speech therapist teach her at home because the next school is too far away. Your turn. Okay. Back. Okay, Sam. Where's the T sound made? Um, in the back. In the back. And where's the T sound made? In the front. In the front. Oh, back. Although the genetic defect is the same, we see a different picture of the same disease when we visited Samantha. At nine years old, she was not able to walk alone and she needed help from others all the time. She lives in Germany and is now educated in a special school for disabled children for four years with the goal to increase her independence. As you can see, the efforts are successful. Samantha came to school four years ago and visits my class since three years. When she came, she was in a wheelchair and could not walk or eat by herself. She wore a diaper and was fully dependent on others' help. From the beginning on, Samantha was very cheerful and enthusiastic to visit our school. She was integrated to the class very fast. She is 10 years now. When she was a baby, we did not know what exactly the problem was. We missed a diagnosis. Even the doctors did not know about it, and we felt very lonesome. The doctors we have now do often not know what to do, because they do not know the disease and do not have another affected child to whom they can compare. We found that doctors often needed our help to understand the situation. But the biggest wish of her mother is that one day Samantha will be able to talk to her. And it's written in the stars. Although medical reports show that Samantha will not be able to speak, my biggest wish is that one day Samantha can talk to me. In Long Island, we meet Will, who loves music and has abilities quite different from other affected children we met. He can play soccer and ride a roller. Unfortunately, his language development is missing. In 2016, my son Will was diagnosed with a CAT6A gene mutation. When I was pregnant with him, everything was great, actually. It was the healthiest I'd ever been in my life. I had been running a lot, eating healthy. I had a great pregnancy. Dr. Jacqueline Harris is a scientist working at Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore. We asked her if it is possible to diagnose the genetic defect prematurely. Most times, cases of CAT6A are not able to be diagnosed prenatally. And in fact, in the majority of cases from what we know, the pregnancy is fairly normal or some mild abnormalities, but nothing that raises alarm bells. And so you can't really test for anything prenatally if you don't know that anything is wrong. So finding really good doctors has been a challenge. Um, when your child has a rare syndrome, nobody has information about it. So it's been up to us as parents to really find the information. And many times 
we're educating our doctors about will symptoms, about potential problems that could come up because we're learning from people in our support group issues that their kids are dealing with and we say to our doctors. We are fortunate that Will's local pediatrician um, is very open to my ideas. In Boston, we ask Dr. Gabrielle Lemire what the difference between CAT6A and CAT6B is. When you compare uh, CAT6A and CAT6B, both conditions um, include um, actually present with developmental delays, so delays in learning skills for children compared to others, uh, also low muscle tone, so hypotonia, feeding difficulties, uh, and also, um, and also uh, language delays. Uh, one uh, of the difference between CAT6B CAT and CAT6A is that individuals with CAT6B uh, often have um, more malformations of organs. Because of respiratory problems, we had to visit Ella in the pediatric clinic. Ella is a very agile kid who is not shy to be in front of the camera, but unfortunately, she's not able to speak. We ask her parents how daily life is and what expectations for the future they have. Partnership and a special child are also an important issue, especially in the first year when we had a lot of problems with sleeplessness, eating, reflux, our nerves really were down. Not knowing how the things work, we were overstrained and helpless, left alone. From research, we would expect that sometimes drugs are developed which can balance the deficits of CAT6A. We pick up the wish of Ella's parents and ask Dr. Angie, a scientist from Boston, how the future can be. We are um, starting a very long path to get to a place um, where we can say, OK, now we are ready to take this into a clinical trial, trial or um, to try to see how can we translate this into patients. So we are f very far from uh, being in that place. And I believe that a strategy to get there uh, faster is by working together in different uh, ways and collaborate in terms of what can we do from this basic science standpoint and the applied uh, research to help uh, these patients. So the fact that we are far doesn't mean that there are no hopes. It means that we need to work harder and that we need to raise this sense of urgency, of investment on, uh, and awareness of this uh, disorder. In Chio, a little town close to Venice, we visit Marta, who is 27 years old and gives us an insightful view what can happen in adulthood. She loves riding her horse, and once again, we are surprised how this disease can show such different pictures from severe disability to milder courses, which can enable a nearly independent life. She can speak, read, and write. She had an education in school of hotel management and can work in the affiliated pastry shop. Marta was supervised by a specialist in genetic medicine until she was four. Several tests without clear results were performed. The diagnosis of CAT6A was established in February 2019. We are very proud that Marta can bake cakes completely herself. From switching on the baking oven to the preparation and kneading of the pastry, she can do everything herself. Actually, she also can cook simple food like pasta chuda. In a group of volunteers which dedicate their time and energy to organize events for the disabled, she met Simon and fell in love with him. L'autonomia di Marta 
We work on Marta's autonomy, and I hope that one day she will be able to live an independent life, maybe together with people who assist her or her brother, who helps her in difficult situations. Of course, it is a big dream that one day she will have a partnership, but I do not believe that she one day can educate a child herself because of her genetic defect. Non penso sarà possibile per lei crescere dei bambini. Warren is 37 years old and loves to hear his father singing during walking. Till his 30th year of life, he was recognized as disabled until a genetic test proved the diagnosis of Cat 6A. Warren lives together with his sister, who has autism, in an institution for assisted living close to his parents. What's your favorite thing in the world to eat, Warren? Brownies. Brownies and sweet potatoes. You could live on those. So, here, would you like part of a brownie? All right, here's your choice. About seven or eight years ago, we had genetic testing done on both our children, and Warren's testing came back with Cat 6A. And that was, I guess he was about 30 years old. Until then, we really didn't know what, he had been diagnosed with autism, but we never felt that was really the right diagnosis, but there was nothing else that we knew of that it could be. We want to know more about the consequences of a genetic defect and ask Dr. Sarah Baumgartner. The Cat 6A syndrome is a syndrome which is caused by a genetic defect. The genes carry all the information needed for the function and development of our body. A defected Cat 6A gene results in the wrong building of a protein, which is needed in a bigger protein complex, to read other genes in other cells. If this does not work correctly, different impairments in different organs of the human body are the result. I can foresee the day um, since, since our technology is moving so quickly and so fast uh, that, uh, that perhaps the uh, CAT 6A uh, syndrome may be, uh, maybe there can be some, uh, G, uh, uh, some repair of the DNA at a very early period. But that's so, so long from now and so far-fetched on, in our case, with our son being 37 and I'm 75 and his, and his mother is, is, will be 68, uh, I, don't, I can't see anything from the research coming that uh, will ha help our particular case. Emma is 27 years old. She can walk, write, and read independently, but she is not able to speak or live alone. Yeah. What's your favorite part of martial arts? The kiai. Kiais? Those are your, what's a kiai? Kiai. <laughs> your exercises and your stretches? Yeah. Yes. With the research, I don't know if, I would love if they could find something and essentially make it go away. I don't, I know it's still new. It's in very early trial phases since this hasn't been around that long. I would love if they could find something to minimize some of the symptoms or at least for kids going forward. For her, this, we're kind of, I think we're, we're here. This is our world. <laughs> Hadley is a happy girl who loves to play with her brothers and sisters. So I think our, one of our biggest problems is I think not having enough time <laughs> to fit everything in every day, um, just managing everything. But my biggest wish um, is her just having medical stability. I think just being healthy, us being able to 
try to carry on with a normal family life as possible with all the... You can go. The whole family is dedicated mm -hmm. to Hadley. Her mother works very hard with her and even brings her to horse therapy. Her grandmother bakes breads and donuts, which are sold in different shops. All the profits are given to the Cat 6A Foundation. Once more, we visit Dr. Angie Serrano and ask her what the problems and difficulties in research are. How late we are in understanding Cat 6A and Cat 6B not only in the context of the disorder, but also the biology. We know very little about that. And one of the main reasons of that, which is one of the challenges of rare disorders, is that there are not enough awareness, there are not enough investment in this kind of research, because they enter into a category of diseases that are known here in the United States, at least as a disorder that affects fewer than 200,000 individuals. So there is not investment for pharmaceutical, there is not enough interest for, from government to actually find a biology and actually to think about the next step to, to approach this and to help patients. And that's where we factor in. We feel that what we need to do is to facilitate research and that's how here from the Center of Regenerative Medicine at the CREM and the CAT6 Foundation, we said, let's establish a research resource that will allow several research labs to study this from the biology to the more applied um, uh, areas. And that's why we started uh, collaborating together for founding the first IPSC bank, uh, induced pluripotent stem cell bank of CAT6A and CAT6B disorders. Sophia is 27 years old and received the diagnosis of CAT6A syndrome four years ago. Because of not otherwise manageable aggressions, a neurosurgical therapy had to be performed twice. She needs 24-hour care. Our daily life looks like this. My daughter wakes up at 7 in the morning, gets prepared for the daycare center, and we have breakfast together. About 8, the taxi arrives to bring her to the daycare center, which ends at 4 o'clock p.m. When she arrives home, she wants to hear music with my cell phone and her headphones to calm down. Most times, we go out for a 30 to 45 minute walk. After dinner, she goes to bed about 7 p.m. From our government, we have a personalized budget for Sophia, with which we can recruit a nurse for some hours. But we should have more help, which is difficult to get. Max is also strongly dependent on help. We asked his mother what her expectations for the future are. It's very difficult because not many other people know of Cat 6A, and uh, I have to explain it to many of his, many new doctors, and still many don't understand it. So I would hope for research t for more people to understand what's going on, be able to have some more understanding and supports for him in the future. We saw a completely different picture visiting 11-year-old Izzy, who is, despite an intellectual delay, nearly inconspicuous. With Cat 6A, where we feel alone is our community, with us being the only people pretty much in the state, um, nobody knows what it is. And so when you go to your doctor, when you go to school, you're having to tell them everything about this disorder and they can't understand it because they don't have something to compare it to. So we feel very alone in that nobody truly understands what Izzy goes through every day to grow, to learn and to progress. The outside help that we most need for Izzy our speech therapies, occupational therapies. Um, we do a music therapy, which is very crucial for her. It helps her brain, I think, 
maybe work a little better, a little more effectively, um, things like that that would advance her ability to communicate better. Um, so we have a son, Jack, who is six and a half years old, who was diagnosed with cat 6A syndrome when he was 10 months old. Um, so it was back in December 2016. And there were times, there were times when he was in the hospital that a doctor would come in and say, you know, at one point when he was having a lot of trouble breathing, a doctor came in and said, well, we should do a tracheotomy. Um, and we said no, yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> this isn't a typical kid. Um, and we realized through that experience and, and a couple others that um, you need to you need to advocate more for a child who can't tell you what's wrong, um, who isn't typical. Because a lot of the doctors they're just operating off of a baseline of a normal typical kid or person, and Jack is not that. Um, so. It, it takes, it, you know. You have to work a little harder. <laughs> yeah, highly trained doctors don't love being told that they're potentially wrong by people <laughs> that aren't doctors, um, but you kind of just have to do it and um, because you got to do what's, what's best for your, your child. Jonah and see again a quite different state of the disease. His appearance attracts attention, but he is a good pupil and he is doing well. Jonah was first diagnosed with CAT 6B in 2018 when we went to the geneticist in CHOP, uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and we got um, an accurate diagnosis through the genetic chromosome uh, blood test. We could have told you probably when he was eight weeks old, that there was something 100% wrong, but officially in 2018. You want some yogurt? Uh, yeah, yes. mom gave you a snack. What's the kid's name? Tell dad too, because he doesn't know everybody. The, I did not tell you, Sam, um, Sam invited me to her bar mitzvah. What? Yeah. Yeah, she wants him to come. She asked for his address. My biggest wish is that he would read. That would be his conduit to being able to thrive on his own in the future. Um, that's, that's my biggest wish. What's your biggest problem? That he doesn't read. <laughs> <laughs> he's a happy-go-lucky boy. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, he's the light of the room when he walks in. I wouldn't change anything. I think my biggest wish for Jonah is to... to be able to be in society and be accepted to who he is. Uh, he is the light, as Ryan said. He walks in, everybody knows him, everybody loves him. He makes friends wherever he goes. But he's different, right? He's different. He's not like everybody else, and I think that's what makes him truly special. I think the biggest problem, I think, is that he can't read and that he can't be independent. He's going to be dependent on others for the rest of his life. Carlchen, as his mother calls him by the nickname to Carl, is a sprightly small boy from Germany with Cat 6B and a real Instagram star. Within his family, with his brothers and sisters, who care lovingly for him, he feels best. We have four kids, and as parents, we do not think that the others feel untended. We have big support from my and from my husband's parents. Our experiences with doctors were very good, especially from the doctor who first cared for Carl and suggested to perform genetic diagnosis. We have her full support for everything needed, in the hospital, we had good experiences as well. Yeah. 
Osman, a child from Lebanon parents, likes music, but he only plays his keyboard when he is in the right mood. We were happy that he gave us a concert. Okay. You don't want to watch Madagascar? I can have that movie? I don't want a Madagascar show today. You don't want to have that Madagascar show today? What? Can I have your view? We asked his mother how daily life is for them and what her wishes for the future are. So things can get tricky when my husband travels a lot for work. Um, and so things can get tricky when I am juggling between being able to do things for both kids and Usman's stuff is always very, very important and um, necessary. And my husband tries his best when he's you know, home to do as much as he can as well. And so a lot of those Balancing those schedules can be tricky. Um, work, you know, using therapy methods at home continuously can be tricky. Taking Usman out can be tricky. <laughs> um, you know, kind of explaining to other people what his needs are or how he will best um, um, live, a, you know, the best life is tricky. Um, there's a lot of trickiness involved, I think. <laughs> um, but I think we're so used to Usman's, you know, um, schedules and things that are needed for him that at home we are able to balance it still a little bit easier. Um, when we are out, it can be, we find that most people are very loving and generous and caring. Um, and they try to understand and be flexible, but there are things that are like sometimes so hard to understand that even those things are kind of above their grasp. So that's when things can be tricky. Oh, come on! Come on. The girl isn't ready, buddy. I guess it's not a story. I think my biggest wish is for him to be able to live his life happily without bounds. Emil Nam from Lebanon is CEO of the Cat6 Foundation in the United States. His son Peter loves to be underway with his family by bicycle. All of them like music and Peter plays the drums in the band of his brothers and sisters. His vocabulary contains 40 words for the moment and he is still progressing. His mother is a medical doctor, co-founder, and director for science and research of the Cat6 Foundation. Hey, my name is uh, Natasha. I was born and raised in Lebanon. And then in 2007, I met my husband, Emil, and we both came to the United States of uh, America. I was uh, doing my uh, residency uh, for internal medicine in Lebanon. So when I came to the United States, I had to uh, continue my residency and during my first year of residency in Wichita, Kansas, my first son, Peter, was born. He was born through a normal delivery and uh, didn't have any issues when he was born until the age of 18 months when he was diagnosed with severe autism and global developmental delays. Fast forward, it was until the age of eight that he was diagnosed with the CAT6A gene mutation. He was the 39 in the world with this diagnosis. The doctors didn't have much answers, so my husband and I had to look ourselves, and we found a group of parents uh, interested in starting a foundation. So with a small group of parents, we started the CAT6A Foundation in 2017. Lily, who is six years old, 
lives with her American parents in Germany. She needed cardiac surgery because of a congenital heart defect. Except for speaking, she is able to do nearly everything. Her mother tells us about the cross-border activities of the foundation and the individual benefit for them. Okay, would we enjoy an international get-together? Of course, we would love that. <laughs> uh, we already had like a small one where we went to Innsbruck and we were able to meet another Cat 6A family and Monica and um, some of the people on the uh, Cat 6A Austria board um, and hear about some of the things that they were doing, which is amazing. So, yeah, we would love to meet more families um, internationally. And um, I think that the biggest um, resource for us has not been doctors because doctors don't know what Lily has. If we go to a new doctor, they have no idea what Cat 6A is. We have to tell them what it is. Um, but finding other parents that, of kids that have Cat 6A, those are the people that have been resources for us. So... Um, if we can connect with other families and help them and they help us, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Our visit to Benjamin was overshadowed by a medical emergency. Benjamin had to go to the hospital and we were not sure if we could see him. I'm Katie Bader. And I am a mom to Benjamin, who is seven years old. Um, I would say that our biggest challenge in his life from birth until now, and actually this week has been incredibly challenging, is any gut health. Um, we have done everything from Miralax to enemas to Prilosec to different medicines to try to clean out his gut. Um, the when he doesn't sleep, it's because his stomach is upset. Um, and actually this week we ended up in the ER just two days ago. Benjamin had a, a ball of stool that was blocking his rectum and it was causing him so much pain that he hadn't slept. We are the parents to Helene, who was born in July 2018. She was a wonderful baby, but I early recognized that something was wrong with her. The doctors, whom I asked, were not aware of any symptoms, although I told them many times to have a closer look at my daughter. For me, it was the first time being a mother, and I knew that something serious was wrong, because my baby did not want to drink, neither my breast nor the bottle, did not have any eye contact, and had a very stiff posture. About eight months later, Helene's eye doctor told me that something was wrong with her, and she recommended some other locations, where it was confirmed that she was not healthy. Several examinations followed, and a serious delay of her mental and physical health was detected. When she was one year old, she was finally diagnosed with Cat 6A syndrome. She was not able to speak and had a very stiff posture. She started walking when she was two years old. Her eye contact also developed very late, when she was four years old, she suddenly developed heavy vomiting, and the first thought we had was, oh no, sick again, because she often was. We first thought that this was not bad, but despite of that, we went to the emergency room, where she was known well. But we were not taken seriously. She was apathetic and pale, and the only examinations were a look in her mouth and her ears. But then the general conditions rapidly worsened, and we felt that it was going down. But at this moment, we were not aware that she should become an angel. But it happened, and nobody helped her. 
Doctors should have done blood samples at the beginning and should have taken our complaint seriously because she had a genetic defect and was not able to communicate her complaints. But instead of investigating her, we were sent to a next door room and our child died in our arms. And we miss her so. It is very bad that those kids are not taken seriously. is that much more is understood about CAT 6A and treatments can uh, come out as a result of research that you know, improves the quality of life for our kids with CAT 6A. I think the biggest wish for any parent of a child like ours is uh, the future. That we know that when we're gone that um, they're going to have a productive future. Um, not just being taken care of, but being a, an integral part of society. Um, using the gifts that they have and um, also allowing others to help them uh, reach their goals. So just living a, a, a really great, productive life. Uh, having a child with CAT 6A or a child with CAT 6, uh, there's a lot of isolation. Uh, there's a lot of loneliness. Um, going to the grocery store or uh, taking him to the park. Um, just a lot of isolation, uh, especially as he gets older. It's hard to develop friendships and, and maintain them. Our, probably our biggest wish is to help with communication because he's uh, extremely nonverbal. Um, this is pretty much the kind of communication we get. It's grunts and um, cries and some laughing, but yeah. Relaxing holiday, um, it, it's all in the mind because Anyone looking in from the outside, it's, it, it's not gonna look very relaxing, nor is it relaxing, but um, I think in our minds, we've learned to ma make the best of it. Uh, and we usually don't really go anywhere for holidays because it's, it's too hard um, to take him into other people's homes or even family's homes and where he will be comfortable and not um, maybe destroy other people's things. Um, because, not because he wants to, but because he doesn't understand. Um, so a relaxing holiday means uh, staying at home and um, just, just trying to enjoy the, the simplicity of it. A healthy person has thousands of wishes. A sick person, only one. How moderate this single wish can be, we found during our visits. Why is it so important to inform and to point to such a rare disease? Because loneliness is never good for the concerned people. Because research and medical care for the individual is important, although the disease only affects a minority because information always is useful and it helps to lose its fright, because knowledge can save lives, because there are human beings who cannot raise their voice for themselves and would not receive appropriate help, 
because we should care for the whole individual human being and not only see the disease. We suppose that there are more affected people with this disease around the world, and so we hope that this film helps to increase the attention and one day the critical size could be reached to generate more resources for research and care. We wish that one day we will be able to develop therapies which can increase the quality of life and hopefully one day this disease can be healed. Until this day, we want to understand the particular situation. We want to approach the affected families, give them all the needed support and embrace the unperfect within the perfect with our tender love and care.